I do believe we are live. Welcome, everybody, to another excellent episode of the Break the Rules live stream, breaktherules.tv. Be sure to subscribe, add a like, patreon.com slash breaktherules. I'm your host, Lev Polyakov, at Lefpo on Twitter. Slavu Ukraini. I'm saying it one more time. Slavu Ukraini. I hope that everything is going well. The view is not right endorsed there. by everyone at BTR, but... No, well, that makes, uh, that makes only one of us, honestly. I mean, I'm, for, uh, no, I'm not going to get into it right now, but the point <laughs> is, is that I'm glad that hopefully things are going to be uh, cooling down there. And uh, I'm also going to be working on a project to help out with uh, Kevlar vests in eastern Ukraine. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But anyway, we have with us the wonderful, the amazing Jonathan Kay, Canadian journalist, editor-in-chief of The Walrus, and senior editor of Quillette, which is a great publication, also a, a member of FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. So I am very honored to have Jonathan Kay with us today to speak about basically the things that are going on, not just in Canada, but in the entire world. And I think your book, Among the Truthers, that you wrote, I think, 11 years ago, was it now? How, how long? Yeah, yeah, it was. Two, uh, the days are long and the years are short. Uh, 2011. It's been 11 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So yeah. the book, Among the Truthers, A Journey Through America's Growing Conspiracist Underground. I think this talks to the situation that's, go uh, that's going on right now. I don't know whose microphone that is, by the way. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know how much of a line we can draw with the things that are going on right now with the uh, very online culture's reaction to things that are going on in the world, theories that are being concocted of what exactly is going on. But uh, well, um, before, well, before I ask the initial question uh, to Jonathan, I just wanted to uh, find out if there's anything else you would like to add as far as what is the reason why you got into the field that you're in in the first place? And since you've been in this field for a long time, what is your general feeling of being within it? And then we could get to the uh, Among the Truthers and all that. Oh, you are muted right now. There we go. So you're talking about journalism in general? Yes. Uh, well, you know what? Um, it's actually funny you say that. I was just talking to this 24-year-old kid here in Canada who's thinking of becoming a sports journalist, of all things. Uh, and he wanted my advice, which... I think disqualifies them from the field uh, to begin with, but I was I was happy to, to provide my insights. Um, what you know these days, you got to hustle. You got to be you know. It sounds like you guys know this. You're doing five different things. Uh, I'm older than you guys. You know, 20 years ago when I got into the field, you could do one thing. You could say I'm an editor, or I'm a writer, or uh, I'm a you know copy editor. I guess you could say you were a podcaster. Podcasting was just starting back then. Uh, now I think everybody I know who's successful does, does many different things. Um, and, and that's certainly changed. You know, it used to be, I'd have friends who were just professional book authors. I think unless you're an academic or your name is Stephen King, that's very difficult now. Um, by the way, just one thing to correct you. I, you mentioned some of my credentials, which is great. Um, I, I was ed an editor at a place called the Walrus. That was a couple of years ago. Uh, right now, as you mentioned, Quillette is my main gig, and I write sometimes for the National Post here in Canada. Mm. Uh, those, those are my, yeah, those two. And I, I write books sometimes, but uh, and and the podcast stuff. But everybody I know who's in the field is just is they have many many irons in the fire because you never know when one of them is going to get taken out, right? Well, I was going to say, um, it's actually funny. Um, I was questioning the walrus one because I, I wouldn't imagine you being there nowadays under the uh, current um, climate but well, uh, there, there was an incident that happened right john there was a uh, there was some cancellation of some sort i'm not really sure exactly exactly the reasons but can you get into what why exactly there was some kerfuffle going on at the walrus so this is ancient history now this is uh this 2017 see it's interesting i was uh it seems like yesterday, but I was there for two years between 2015 and 2017. And um, I mean, for people who are watching this work in Canada, the walrus is kind of like, you know, it's like Harper's Magazine. Or it's, it's a pretty progressive place. Uh, I think I was a sort of unconventional hire there. Um, yeah. And you know, my politics, I think everybody involved, including me, knew that uh it wasn't a real close fit but you know i work with some really smart people uh 
but in the end, in the end, it, it it ended up being a benefit to some extent because I was able to watch up close the kind of ideological forces that are that especially young people are dealing with. Like if you're a young editor in a place like Canada, and you know you're you're looking to advance yourself within the literary milieu, maybe you want to get a job as an associate professor one day. Um, you're hoping to get on a panel to, you want to get a grant or give a grant. Um, you want to be in that milieu. There's a ton of pressure on you. And I was able to see that up close because the kind of people who work for the walrus and write for the walrus are in that milieu. And, and I, I'm certainly not here to badmouth them because they're under an incredible amount of stress. Like a lot of these are very smart people, very principled people in many cases, and they have a tough road because you know you're not getting a lot of money uh again I, I i don't know the mix of the national mix of people watching this this live stream but i imagine this thing isn't different when you're in canada the united states as you're you know a, 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 an ambitious high concept writer or a poet or an editor at a literary publication you're not making a lot of money right so it's not like you're there because you're you want you know you make you're putting up with stuff because you're making a quarter million dollars a year. You're not making a lot of money. You're probably living like a student like with a roommate. Uh, the people you went to university with are making a lot more money than you. And there was a time when you would do this because you wanted the artistic freedom to be in the creative class, right? Like your friends would go work and become lawyers or accountants or whatever and this boring stuff. And you'd be like this creative person um, and in return for not making a lot of money, you could live a kind of bohemian lifestyle, sort of thumb your nose at the elites, write stuff that gets people pissed off, be, you know, be a sort of enfant terrible. Mm -hmm. But in the age of, of social media, where these groups crowdsource their own ideological discipline and they're disciplining, each, they're using social media to keep each other in line, it's, you can't be an enfant terrible. You know, you're gonna get, <laughs> you're gonna get canceled. Um, and so in my, I mean, I was kind of lucky because I was older than a lot of these people and I already had a career going. So I was able to just kind of leave and I joined, mm -hmm. I joined Quillette and I kind of picked up where, where I left off before the two years I spent at the Walrus. But the people who were much younger than me, who were trying to make a career at a place like Walrus, it's tough. And, and, and uh, sometimes we talk about cancel culture, like everybody who's within cancel culture or within that sort of ideological sphere is a kind of tyrant but most of them aren't tyrants most of them are just they're kind of they're terrified <laughs> like you no, know i i know exactly yeah. what you're talking about yeah. like at the uh, arts club i've spoken to a few people and they've expressed similar attitudes that they wish they could say certain things that i'm able to say but they cannot and unfortunately i think a lot of people who are online they lump everybody into the same category as members of as mention smoldbug likes to term i'm sure you've heard of this term the cathedral you know this yeah. idea of this very ideologically driven machine where everybody has to think the same way but if i were to give them some credence i would say that if there are people out there who are scared and don't act at what point does it become that whole i was just doing my job if we're well, talking about yeah so i'm very careful about stuff like that because I'll give you an example uh like just in so i live in a very left-wing neighborhood geographically um i i'm actually i live in uh i don't know if you remember maybe you're too like jack layton he's the leader of the ndp in oh you live in the that riding yeah that right yeah oh my god <laughs> and, and, and the weird thing is so i actually got along with jack layton he was like oh yeah he was, he was like, good dude. well, he was an old school socialist, right? And he, yeah. he, uh, shoe leather socialist and he had time for people and he cared about working class stuff. Not, I, you know, I'm a privileged person. So I, I want to say, you know, I, it's not like I met him when I was in line at the soup kitchen or anything like that, but he's, um, this is his writing. It's, it's, it's become a sort of limousine liberal writing where it's kind of, it's gotten Very richer. So. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like, you know, it, a lot of like, Anyways, a lot of CBC types. Again, I don't want to demonize anybody, but it's so when I go to say the schoolyard and I hear people talking, or like there's this place called Carrot Common, which is this huge health food mecca, 
And like in my neighborhood, there's a lot of media types. There's a lot of people I know. There's a lot of parents of my kids, friends. And I hear a lot of stuff that, you know, inside, maybe my eyes, eyes are rolling. And I, you know, there's this thing like, well, we need to speak out. We need to, to confront people when they're, you know, saying things that are wrong or we need to stand up for our values. But like, I don't do that all the time because if I did, I just, every day would be an ordeal. And, and I think a lot of people make trade-offs like that. Maybe even in their sort of in their marriages or in their friends or in their family, like you go to Thanksgiving dinner and your, your parents say stuff that, you know, now it used to be, by the way, that parents would be the conservative ones and the kids would be rolling their eyes. But now sometimes it's the opposite. It's like, you know, your woke 60 year old aunt is saying this. Like, Whine aunt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool uh, aunt. <laughs> um, and you're like, oh my God, that's, that's some crazy stuff. Mm. You, you, got, you got to stay off Tumblr. Um, but, but how do we balance that? But, but so I was just saying about this thing, the national arts club, cause you, you, you were mentioning, you see this in mm. academic faculties and you see it at magazines where people are like, look, just leave me alone. I'm writing a book about the history of the apricot. Like all I care about are apricots, right? And, and that's like 99% of scholars want to write the history of the apricot. Like it could be apricot, could be thermodynamics. It could be, you know, I don't know, cardiac health. It could be, you know, uh, Edward II. Whatever their apricot is, 99% of academics just want to be left alone to write the history of the apricot. And then someone comes to them and says, okay, I'm going to leave you alone to write the history of the apricot if you say a land acknowledgement and you put your pronouns on your door and you come to faculty lounge meetings and you act as an ally, but you only have to do all this stuff once a month, you know, how hard is that? And they're like, well, okay, that's not so hard, I guess. And so like they do this and I probably would do this stuff too. If I like dedicated my life to that kind of cloistered cathedral like existence, like that would seem like a fair deal because you know, this land acknowledgement stuff is, it's not going to do anything. Like, it's not like I say the land acknowledgement and a puff of smoke goes up and all of a sudden, like, my house is gone and it's owned by, you know, a First Nations group. Like, it, so a lot well, of wait, people just, say just, yes Sorry, you get in the trouble for a tweet like well, that. Well, just for actually. the people who don't know what <laughs> we're did, talking yeah. about, Jonathan, just for the people who don't know what we're talking about, can you please explain in brief what is this uh, land acknowledgement? Okay, well, if you're in anywhere, Canada here, yeah, it's like, go ahead. Yeah. Well, geo, you know, no, it sounds like geo, I don't have to explain it to him. Anyone in Canada who's been paying any kind of attention knows what it means. And, and in Australia, and I think even in the United States, uh, Hawaii, which of course is an indigenous population, which is still very politically active. And, uh, you know, there are many parts of the world where people say land acknowledgements. These have become, I would say, institutionalized, kind of like secular prayers that you recite typically orally, but more and more they become for events. Yeah, uh, sometimes you actually now seeing them at like sports events, but especially before lectures now. Oh yeah, uh, academic lectures, academic meetings, trade groups, uh, political conventions, and it will be something like a very simple one would be like um, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which we hold this event uh, was once and continues to be the home of XYZ indigenous group um, who have long had a thriving existence on this territory, which it's not it's by no means an objectionable thing. It's actually a very nice thing. I have friends in Seattle. They've become very big in Seattle. Um, I mean, I've, there was a couple of Imagine months ago. Imagine my shock. Well, no, but there was this became this, I don't know if you guys saw it. It went viral, like for all the wrong reasons, but Microsoft. Oh yes. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. the product launch from Microsoft? I, I forget the exact product, but I, I do remember they were incorporating it within their. Yeah, everyone I mean, forgets the product. Their... That's why it was it was such a disaster because no one remembers the product. They just remember <laughs> like what a farce it was. Where this this guy comes on, he literally said. So he said the land acknowledgement. All right, whatever. Then he he said his pronouns. Okay, get on with it. Uh, and then remember, he said, "I'm a early '30s white man who's very privileged, wearing a blue denim shirt." And we were like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one. And 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 it became it was like a land acknowledgement, gender acknowledgement, shirt acknowledgement, uh like every it, so it kind of this idea of acknowledging where you're standing has sort of metastasized in combination with uh pronoun checks into like this kind of autobiographical check. Like and then I remember everyone was making fun of them and my friend who's a VP at Microsoft I was getting on his case on Facebook and he was saying 
yeah, but you know, this is for this is for the sight impaired. It's like so the sight impaired. It's like the sight impaired don't give a fuck what kind of shirt this guy's wearing. They just want to hear about like what kind of nerd box he's selling. Uh, but it, it. So anyway, this is all the rant stemmed from this land acknowledgement thing. They became very big around 2010 in Canada because that's when the Vancouver Olympics were. Mm. And there was a lot of fear that indigenous politics might screw up the stuff going on around the 2010 uh, Olympics in Vancouver. And so part of, you know, way to uh, make things politically smooth was uh, land acknowledgements were used to, you know, it was public gesture, well-intentioned public gesture toward indigenous groups. But now it's kind of just become this very cynical thing that's um, that's used to signal, I would argue in many cases, it's it's a sort of virtue signaling thing. And I realize people who do virtue signaling hate the term virtue signaling, um, but I haven't found a better term to describe virtue signaling. Hmm. So I'm going to continue yeah. virtue signaling. In Australia, it's a bit different. I think uh, they're, they're a bit more... Um... It's more of like uh, the indigenous people themselves like share their culture. It's here in Can. It seems that Canada has the most, um, I would say, hair trigger response to indigenous issues throughout the mm. world. I mean, it's, in America, this is almost unheard of, apart from like northern mm. states. But it's no, you're right about Australia because I remember I was I was going on about the land acknowledgement thing, and I, I think a conservative guy from Australia told me that even. In Australia, conservatives are are actually quite fine with land acknowledgements. They they, it's it's like it's it's much more established and I think a less politically yeah uh, loaded thing than here in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, well, so uh, mm -hmm. oh, go, oh go, go, go on, Gia. No, I had a spiel, uh, but you go ahead well, first, and then I'll all right. Do it. So there is an interesting uh, section from your book, which I recommend everybody uh, to check out, and uh, the section goes like this. The image of the world that emerges from this catalog bears little resemblance to the world most of us know. It is a dark, conspiratorial place. To take the right-wing sites as an example, Christianity is under siege. Political correctness has gone amok. Militant gay athe uh, activists have taken over every school board. Atheists, too. <laughs> gay atheists, and the White House <laughs> flies the green flag of Islam. So other than the last part... It almost seems like a lot of these things that were talked about back in 2010, 2011 as being, you know, crying over nothing. It almost seems like certain areas are starting to creep up. I never want to attribute anything to a smoke filled room. But do you see? Well, actually, can I say now yes. okay. I wanted to begin. Um, this is actually quite surreal. I floated the idea of interviewing you to love because I've been reading you. Oh, how shall I put this? A little bit critically since around like 2010, maybe 20, 2009, because okay. I was a vociferous National Post reader growing up. Um, and, you know, you were obviously more of like, I would say the like, you know, like the token kind of lib of the National Post of like the heyday of George Will, bit. Barbara yeah, Kay, yeah. Yeah. Um, while Michael Corrin before his you know, heel to yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, and I remember when you came out with uh, Among the Truthers and you did actually the Michael Corrin show. And I remember you did that, um, the meeting where they found out that you were a glowy infiltrator fed and they freaked out. It was on YouTube. I think you went to some 9 11 truth meeting, if I recall. And uh, they were all uh, up in arms. Um, and so, yeah, but then of recent years, I would say since 2016 onwards, um, when you start, I, I forget exactly when you started with Quilette, mm -hmm. but I started reading your Twitter and I'm like, oh my God, this is Jonathan Kay. No, like this, this is not the Jonathan Kay I remember. <laughs> so, um, and, and as, as, as Michael Corrin, who I worshipped at the time, uh, went that way, you went kind of another way and uh so i uh again yeah i thank you for coming here but what i wanted to talk about specifically i guess with among the truthers is um how has the landscape changed in you i mean we'll get to a little bit of canada yeah. stuff as well i, th but, I um, think geo and i are asking the same question here pretty yeah, much like how has yeah. it changed not just the political correctness stuff sure. but also the character of the conspiracy i guess you could call it a movement if it's a movement but uh <laughs> yeah. how has it sort of become a bit different from like 
I can we even say nine eleven on YouTube? But like, yeah, like yeah, uh, that the, that particular uh, day, the loose change yeah. stuff. Sure. But sure. also, yeah. and also uh, your views on it as well. If uh, things if have changed a, in that department as well, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and and uh, I, I'd also like yeah a- answer Gio's question about. Um, I guess I've changed a bit, although I, I like to think I haven't changed as radically as Michael Corrin, who he swung oh. he swung from like arguably the most conservative pundit in Canada. Oh yes. To a guy who, who just like drinks every flavor of progressive Kool Aid you can pour down his throat. I mean, he's just and like, all at once in the span of a month it took. In yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> he's like um, conversion therapy, political conversion <laughs> therapy. Yeah, it's crazy. So. Um, so uh, that's a little inside joke because Michael used to be in favor of conversion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think it's this this podcast is way too Canadian. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of these references you have to like live within like the same 20 square block area of Toronto to get. But so, so but anyway, so I'll stick with the book thing. Um, so the fundamental aspect of conspiracism remains unchanged, which is uh, conspiracism is an explanation for evil. Uh, why do bad things? Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, it's a question we all ask ourselves in some way, and conspiracy theories give an answer to that question, and they also provide a language of distrust. So, um, distrust in all forms of elites. So, the media, uh, political elites, of course, religious elites, corporate elites, and so people who have radicalized theories of distrust. And are looking for any kind of um, systematic or faux systematic understanding of why evil things happen all over the universe. Conspiracy theories are extremely attractive, and they will always remain attractive for that reason. Is that, insofar as bad things happen to good people, which unfortunately will happen forever, uh, and people lose trust in one another, and they lose trust in the institutions governing their society, conspiracy theories will always be with us. That part is as true now as it was when I wrote the book, which in turn was as true when JFK was assassinated, um, you know, when French Revolution, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, like these are all manifestations of, of, of the same all too human phenomena. Uh, what has changed is social media. And I wrote a little bit about social media in the book, but social media was by our standards in its infancy when I wrote this book. You know, I started researching and writing this book in 2007, 2008, 2009, yep. 2010. It was published 2011. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, Facebook existed in 2007, but uh, it wasn't exactly the, um, the juggernaut it is now. And what, what has radically changed for conspiracism in regard to the Internet is that conspiracism was kind of more of a little bit of a one way street before social media. So you would get these quote unquote conspiracy theorists who would create movies or uh, books, you know, uh, this guy, you know, Loose Change, L- Luke Rudkowski, I think was his name. Luke Rudowski. Rudowski. He's on the uh, Tim Pool's yeah. uh, program now. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he had like other ones making videos like Ryan Dawson and. Uh... Yeah. I mean, it be, but it was you, it, it wasn't a completely one way, but. It was largely these sort of name brand conspiracy theorists. Uh, Richard Gage was a big guy in the 9-11 mm-hmm. field. Uh, Joseph Farah was a big uh, mm-hmm. bir- birther. He was, uh, World Net Daily. Eh? With, I, think, <laughs> yeah. I, I think might still be around, right? Um, he's, I think he's still around. Jerome Corsi is still around. Uh, Jerome Alex Corsi. Jones was going since the 90s. Jerome so. Corsi. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so by the World Net Daily is, uh, for those who may have heard of it, that's the website that told us that drinking soy milk makes you gay. Uh, that's <laughs> where it's from. You yeah. know the soy boy, the whole uh, soy boy meme. Soylent, yeah. Oh, think... jo- so Jonathan on the 4chan, the whole uh, soy makes you effeminate thing has been taken up. Where anytime a man smiles with the uh, mouth, you know, out like this, you know, making uh, like that kind they of thing. They call face. it soy face. Yeah, I think I think that that nonsense started with with Joseph Farah, this, um, or at least his website. But I, I think if you Google it. I'm not going to Google it during the podcast, but I think if you Google, if, if you don't mind polluting your search terms with does soy milk make you gay, I think it's sourced to this 20 year old uh, uh, World Net Daily article. Anyway, so these guys, they were conspiracy theorists. And then you had millions of people who 
you know, it's including like listening to AM radio shows uh, or reading mm -hmm. books. Um, old fashioned, you know, there's a guy, he's actually dead now. He wrote a, a, a famous 9 11 conspiracy book, uh, Crossing the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael oh, um, he, he, uh, Michael he Rupert, checked yeah. out, let's say, mm -hmm. himself. Uh, um, what's his name? Crossing the Rubicon. He did the peak oil stuff. Yeah, he did the um, CIA stuff. CIA stuff. Rupert, Rupert. Um, yeah, Michael Rupert. Michael Rupert. Michael Rupert. Yeah. Yes. yes. He was yeah. also on Joe Rogan's show where he was referring to Fox Magic. I think that was one of his uh, last appearances. And he was involved oh. with Gary Webb in the uh, crack cocaine explosion in the the eighties. Yeah. That yeah, and so he anyway yeah he like Alex Jones he's around for a long time but. Uh, these guys became kind of profit figures. And so when I did my book, this is, I guess, like, you know, almost 15 years ago when I started my research, I was kind of exploring, like, why did you guys find the theories of these sort of conspiracy profit figures so entrancing? Now, though, because of social media, everyone is a publisher and conspiracism is now performative. So it isn't so much, I mean, to some extent, you do see it, like, there are still these kind of like famous, quote unquote, famous conspiracy theorists that people follow. I mean, Alex Jones, I think his star, such as it is, is faded. But, uh, you know, some some guy will come out with a book and people will, will listen to him or a YouTube channel. Um, however, m more and more, it's a kind of call and response type thing where one guy says, oh, yeah, uh, here, Hillary Clinton's a pedophile. Oh yeah, well, you know, I hear she likes this pizzeria in Washington. Oh really? Maybe that maybe they're keeping their pedophiles in the pizzeria, and it becomes this kind of like call and response crowdsource thing, where people are using their social media accounts as kind of conspiracy propaganda outlets. And so instead of having like a bunch, a sort of pantheon of conspiracy theorists who are propagandizing to the masses, you're getting these kind of whole ecosystems of people chattering away with their conspiracy theory and essentially crowdsourcing their conspiracy theories. And a lot of people, I'm, I'm convinced a lot of like with, with Trump, they didn't, many of these people, I don't even think believe their conspiracy theories. They just said them because it bugged the other side. So, you know, you'd, you'd run into these people online and they'd say, Oh yeah, you know, Trump had 5 million people at his, um, <laughs> when he was, when he was sworn in, remember like he had this whole thing that he was, Toward the National Park Service was lying about how many people um, were you know, attended his swearing in. Um, but then you you find these people who pretend to believe Trump's lies, but then you talk to them, it's like, well, you know, I, I think Trump's wrong on this, but whenever I tweet this, it just bugs the shit out of my brother-in-law who's a liberal. And so there's this performative aspect to it. And that didn't exist. When I did my research, that did not exist. This sort of performative call and response culture hmm. where Twitter and Facebook and other social media uh, and YouTube too. Like, I mean, any, anyone listening to this or watching this in 20 minutes could make their own YouTube video, start up a YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Why Jonathan K is wrong. That will be the response video. Sure. To the there are many of those. Yeah. Yes. yeah. No, I'm, and, I'm, I'm more sympathetic. I think, I, I think what happens now in some weird ways is that as crazy as it sounds, I think that when people talk of the sort of, what would you call it, postmodern condition, uh, the, especially from 2016 onwards, the sort of the malleability of the spectacle itself, I think that in some ways it's as if, if enough conscious energy is put out there, it's like it almost not manifests in like, cause that, that's the problem with like a lot of the, you know, Q boomers or whatever, where they're like, Oh, just give it two more weeks, arrested and executed, mm -hmm. right? It's like, no, it's more of like, I think because enough people are sufficiently skeptical of institutions, it's almost as if certain elements of conspir conspiracism manifest themselves mm -hmm. eventually, or enough people are taken to the interpretation that these events manifest themselves. And I wonder if yes, social media... Yes, no, that's, that's interesting. It's like an ergogor in a way. Well, I so think. look, I, I'll just answer briefly because there's a lot of ideas bouncing around here, but I got to say, conspiracism thrives on distrust of elites, but conspiracist narratives often have embedded them in them a perversely grandiose vision of the powers of elites. So like if you mm, look, if yeah. you look at you know 9 911 conspiracy theories George Bush 
actually more often it's Dick Cheney, but like Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, Bush, the people Gonzalez, around him, yeah. yeah, they're seen as like these kind of Darth Vader figures who are capable of coordinating this insanely complicated, also insanely evil, but also insanely complicated plot and getting everything to go right. And then when 3,000 people are dead, they also are able to make sure no one says anything and the entire thing is hushed up. And, and this is true, and this is true, by the way, of the protocols of the elders of Zion in regard to the Jews. The protocol of the elders of Zion obviously is a fraud and you know, millions of Jews have died as a result of that propaganda document because um, it was influential right up to the Nazi era. However, the vision of the Jews that's contained in the protocols, like it casts them as sort of like these powerful lich lords that run the universe. Like it's this perversely, um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not obviously not an affirmative view, but it presents them as extremely powerful and cunning and intelligent evil. Yes. But that is in this contradistinction to the way we now view our leaders. Like it's very difficult to create a similar, so take the, the conspiracy theory I just described about like say Jews or about Dick Cheney or something like that, where like there's these evil geniuses. Imagine taking that theory and applying it to someone like, say, Justin Trudeau or um, <laughs> to someone or like like Joe Biden. It, it's laughable because part of our disrespect for this, the, these elites is that like we think they're bumbling idiots. Mm. And so if somebody said, hey, you know what, I think I think Justin Trudeau planned, you know, I think he tricked Putin into invading Ukraine. What do you think? And I'd like, like, are, are you fucking nuts? Like this guy can't even... Um, he couldn't even rig the SNC thing. Like he got caught out on that and he got yeah. embarrassed. If he can't get the SNC, SNC thing right, how do you think he's going to manage a geopolitical conspiracy? So we have less respect for our leaders, but double-edged sword conspiracy-wise because it also means we're less likely to believe mm. that they're... You know, I, I but, think but, oh, that... Gio, I, I want to I wanna ask the following thing here. This is a very interesting thing you're bringing up with someone like Justin Trudeau, who is absolutely, as far as I could tell, not equipped to uh, be at that level. But then we have somebody like the sinister-looking Klaus Schwab in his Mortal Kombat outfit talking about the Great Reset, and we have people from the World Economic Forum like Trudeau, although funny enough, like Putin as well, who uh, uh, was a uh, as one of the people who's also part of that whole thing. But when I look at that personally, I see a lot of people who like cosplay, a lot of people who like to present this idea of, oh, we're these great thinkers, we're these uh, great yeah. world changers, but I don't really see any substance in them. But at the same time, I do see certain attempts from certain politicians, like the current, I think, uh, Chancellor of the Ekeshe, if I'm pronouncing that term correctly, in uh, London, who's advocating for this new digital currency system and things like that. Are, uh, you know, things like that I think should be of concern to people. But the only problem I think is that journalists who don't like going down the rabbit hole to such an extent that whenever e anything even close to sounding like a conspiracy is brought up, they instantly denounce it. They don't even want to look at it. And in a way, I think it hurts uh, everybody because if there are certain things to grab onto for, to prevent things like a digital currency that can be controllable, like in China, for example, then they should be prevented. I agree with you on that general principle, but I think I'm more favor. I, I agree more with these, these dismissive journalists you're describing because I, Look, I'm older than you guys. I've been through this a few cycles. I don't. You guys remember the Bilderbergers? There's yes. a big thing out oh, the yeah. Bilderberg. The Bilderbergers controlled the universe. Then it was Davos. Remember, it was the people who went to Davos who controlled the universe. The, then, well, th that is those guys. That's the World Economic I, Forum. I mean, it's yeah. kind of those guys, but it's and then yeah, it's World Economic Forum. But like, I'm old enough, and I've been in journalism long enough, and I just hung around Toronto long enough that I've actually met some of the people who go to these events. Like I've I don't met them on ski slopes or in tennis. Uh, clubs and stuff like that and these guys are the same they're the same bumbling guy i mean they're like us they just are much more wealthy and have nicer clothes and the idea that these guys control the universe or that like they can get into some sort of smoke-filled room and like concoct a plot to take over the global currency system i don't think they have that capacity because they're the same they're the same flawed human beings mm. that that everybody we know is um, and it's and it's actually very demystifying to, to meet these people, either professionally or socially. 
Uh, and well, and Conrad Black, regardless of what you think of Conrad Black, I think he actually went to a few Bilderberger meetings. And he was a Club of Rome member. Yeah. He he wrote a column about it, which I remember was like he's very you know yeah, some of his columns are like a little out there, but. Um, this one, he was very, he, he said, if you've ever been to this, it's just kind of a bunch of guys talk, you know, um, sort of talking about the world and their conjectures and, and most of their predictions are wrong. You know, like Davos would, they'd invite a guy like Thomas Friedman or something. Uh, <laughs> just, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And no, and Thomas, and no, and then Friedman would give a speech, of, you know, uh, here we are, we're the age of globalization. Remember Friedman has had that theory that no country with no McDonald's. two countries. Right, yeah. No two countries with a McDonald's had ever gone to war with each other. Guess what? Russia had many, many, many McDonald's. <laughs> and I'm guessing Kiev, Ukraine had a few McDonald's. Too. I think like, Serbia had a McDonald's. And yeah. We maybe, bombed the maybe. crap out of it, I bet. So yeah. the idea is that there's a lot of predictions and the high-flown rhetoric and high-flown networking. And I'm, I'm sure there's lots of like pipeline deals and stuff that, you know, the wheels get greased there. But... I, I, Lev, I, I share the skepticism of many journalists when I get fed this thing like, oh, you guys should investigate the links between, you know, this, hmm. the Freemasons and the Illuminati. And well, no, no, just to be clear, that's not, well, I got to, I got to defend myself just a bit, Gio. Oh. I got to defend myself just a bit. So when I'm talking about uh, the Davos people, the World Economic Forum, I'm not implying that this is a smoke filled room. I'm implying pretty much reading the kind of things that they write, the kind of things they talk about, there do seem to be at least wishes on their parts yeah. to have a certain kind of society. It's not a secret. It's something that's wide uh, open. And so my concern is that this kind of intent, whether we're talking about things like climate, like carbon credits, <laughs> more of a renter-based uh, economy, I don't see things like that being as opposed to by I get mainstream it. journalists. I get it. Although I would, I would argue that plutocrats in our age have as widely variegated interests as as anybody else. Like you look at when Warren Buffett writes columns for the New York Times, Warren Buffett's columns are like, increase my tax rate. You know, billionaires should pay more taxes. Like, like we're no longer in an era mm -hmm. where plutocrats could get in a room and one guy would be like, hey, we need to reduce taxes and reduce regulation. And everyone else would be like, yeah, hey, that's an it's an amazing idea. I totally agree with that. Like, um, we live in a kind of post-materialist age for a lot of these guys where they just they have insane wealth. And like, and you you even see that with guys like Elon Musk. Like Elon Musk spends half his time tweeting and you know, engaging these harebrained schemes and giving weird names to his kids. And like these people have more money than they know what to do with. So they fly off often in some pretty esoteric directions. And so I'm very skeptical that it's like, even at a place like Davos or uh, WEF, that it's like birds of a feather, you know, flocking in formation. I well, think... I I think a lot of these people have very divergent interests and ideas about what the future should look well, like. Well, I, I could give this quick example. Right. I know, Gio, you're, you are itching mm. to talk. I got to give one quick example of a way that I think the world can be healed. There was a program I remember Alex Jones did back with David Gergen where he was oh, talking yeah, about the uh, yeah where he was talking about how he went to bohemian grove and videotaped the whole thing and david gergen didn't say oh that is absolutely false you're There's out no in agreement thing. You, yeah, yeah you followed it yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so david gergen was talking about how he violated this agreement of being there i think or in my head like the perfect world would have been for journalists to go out and say like yeah there's these people they dress up in funny outfits let's you know get to the history behind what exactly this is but I'm not well, seeing that either. There's like almost, that almost a repulsion. He was a gay well, almost a repulsion <laughs> to anything to anything having to do with robes, where either people think that it's people plotting to take over the world, or people don't even want to talk about it. But why not just say, you know, out in the open, like, yes, these people they like all this esoteric stuff having to do with weaving spiders and putting robes on, and you know, having this campfire. Like, why not just say that? I don't know. I mean, who doesn't like a nice robe? Um... True. Like I steal the bathrobe sometimes at the Ramada, so like you know, that's, no, actually you shouldn't do that. It's that's that, but they are extremely plush. Yes, so, they are. Yeah, I, I, I think. Well, yeah, though Alex Jones in his book with uh, Mike Hansen Son. said this was back in like the early two thousands where he was a buffer, 
They, he's like, oh, they thought I was a gay prostitute uh, going in there. There was a bunch of them. But um, no, I think to push back a little bit, I, I think that certainly the elites have divergent interests. I think it's more of a mechanism of like discourse itself and the way that establishment opinion is formed. But I would say that the language around conspiracies, unfortunately, and, you know, let's face it, the term conspiracy itself was created by the Rand Corporation, right? But like, like for example, the one ethnic group you mentioned, um, I think like it's like to bring in and say that there's these conspiracies that are hateful and blah, blah, blah. I think like they're thought terminating devices in a lot of ways. Like to say that a thing is a conspiracy, it sort of warrants like increased skepticism. Like every yes, normal but, person doesn't believe this. It's true, but right. Yeah. So it's a debate ending heuristic, which to be fair, to be depressingly fair, we have a lot of those in our society, right? Oh, like, tons, tons. Like, uh, you're racist, debate's over. You're a fascist, debate's over. Yeah, yeah. You're a communist, debate's over. You no, hate, you're a Russian. You hate they, freedom. You hate yeah. freedom, debate's over. Like, the, the left and the right both have them. Um, or um, my favorite was someone would say something ludicrous. This, is, this became popular in 2019. Less so now, it was so ridiculous. Like some guy would say two plus two equals five. And someone like me would say, well, that doesn't sound right. And they'd say, whoa, what's with the white fragility? Like the idea was like, you could end any debate by you know, saying like, hey, calm down, dude. Because, you know, um, and, and so everybody is lazy. Everybody wants a shortcut to getting everyone else to shut up and accept their truth. And, and so we use these these tricks. And sometimes the trick is, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Unfortunately, there's no systematic way of deciding who's a real conspiracy theorist. Like, hey, I have proof that, you know, whatever, the cast of Happy Days engineered the moon landing or something like that. And people who, like on the other end of the spectrum, you know, people said Iran-Contra was a conspiracy theory, right? And, and also has been pointed out, I mean, it's kind of a hack point, but it's technically true. The official and true account of the 9-11 attacks is itself a story of a conspiracy. It was a conspiracy hatched by Osama bin Laden to dispatch 20 hijackers to kill people in Washington, New York. That's technically it's a conspiracy theory because it's a theory about a conspiracy. So that's one of the frustrations you face when you're investigating that is that there's no hard and fast definition of what a conspiracy theory is. Hmm. But right. the other, uh, I'm laughing at this comment right now. I'm getting word that in 20 minutes, Jonathan K, uh, by based patriots in the RCMP, is going to be arrested and executed in 20 minutes. Shit! Wow, <laughs> that escalated quick. No. Well, this actually <laughs> gets to for the Q what, people, but yeah, for if you don't, yeah, well, this actually gets say to, that get, Hillary's gets to, going to be yes. In twenty, yeah, in in two weeks, it's gonna happen. In so. oh, two more weeks. No, but this gets yeah. to the uh, the question that I had regarding what's going on right now. So, with the situation with uh, Russia and Ukraine, for example, it does seem like a lot of people from the very online community have fully gone to Russia's side. I think partly it's no, also there because are few, there are a few very far right no, people that no, but like Richard Spencer Ukraine. and things like that. I get it, but yeah. still, the majority of people that I find who are let's Greg say Johnson. Of, yeah who are of a younger generation, they tend to look at Russia as being like this last bastion of freedom from the evil globalists, which to me, as somebody who came from Russia, is an absolute ludicrous idea. But they attach this idea of the United States, something that I see both the far, uh, far left and the far right sharing in, being this, uh, you know, the head, head of the snake, so to speak, head of the dragon, being something that's responsible for all the misery and degeneracy in the world. And what I have a hard problem with here is I understand like all the things that we always talk about regarding uh, currency problems, problems with the Great Reset, things of that nature. These should be talked about and aren't talked about enough. But at the same time, it makes so many people go to the other side to support a regime, you know, that's been, uh, you know, waging a war of aggression against the country that didn't do anything to it. Police so action. Yes. Well, well, see, there we go. Like, I don't understand when Geo says things like that. Well, no, but it's I mean, like, I obviously it's like, it's like living like, in this a different is the realm of we reality. Have about the interference that NATO has done in encroaching on Russian territory. But that's 
another stream for another debate. No, but see, even there, no, I think it's perfect for this stream because even there, John, it places blame on this great NATO yeah, machine as responsible for all, of, because, for all the problems. Well, the Russian thing is interesting in terms of what we're talking about because it seems that um, conspiracy was, from my recollection, in the early 2000s, was much more of a open thing. For a while, it became more of exclusively a right-wing thing. But now it seems that with the Russia Gate, it's like, you know, this weird liberal inversion of the Cold War, where it's like, you know, Russia engineered everything and the top media personalities talking about it. But of course, now with the war going on, it seems that, you know, uh, Russia is always the perennial source of the conspiracy, either if you're on the left or the right. If you're like a bircher, it's like, you know, global communism. If you're on the left, it's like, you know, Russia right now is like the Austrian painter. So Putin no, I I, like I, I, dis painter. I disagree. So, I think that right now Russia is being seen by the fringes as the uh, innocent party here, and the evil American Empire is seen as the uh, guilty global but, American but John, Empire. Listen, global American Empire. But John, what what do you think? So again, you know, I sort of <laughs> uh, I'm a little older, so I've, I've seen some of these these things cycle. So what I find is that disaffected members of any society are constantly on the lookout for radical alternatives to what they regard as the weaknesses and the corruption and the stagnation of their own society, right? Because um, familiarity breeds contempt and we are all extremely familiar with the deficiencies of our own society. So, um, you know, we get mad at capitalism, we get mad at democracy, we get mad at ideological pluralism and, we start, we crave a more romantic and like purified way of living. So it's, this is how religious people think, um, you know, this is how communists think, this is how fascists think, but you know, it's often even people with mainstream politics think this way. So where do people get those? Like, what are the alternatives to our society that are available to us? Well, for a lot of people, it's like, we need to return to some kind of indigenous Edenic sort of pure pre-industrial kind of um sort of um like a land of the elves uh, ted k pill ted k pill yeah. or or avatar you know the, the land of yeah. avatar um this was sort of you know if if you're in canada you might uh, there's a guy um that wasn't a gray gray owl who was like a oh, yeah. hundred years ago he was he's actually this fraud from scotland who pretended he was indigenous but he wrote <laughs> these books he pretend like he channeled this idea of sort of indigenous the indigenous world is being like this very pure place to and and people liked it because it was kind of like a quasi christian sort of world but you still mm. see that you still see people they crave you know that's their fantasy or it's a marxist fantasy mm. or it's some combination of like marxism and indigenous stuff well it's like rousseau's the noble savage in a way exactly yeah yeah they call it primitive communism that's what they Marx but, termed for it, yeah. But but right, yeah, and and Marx was actually extremely dismissive of um, a lot of. Right. The, Marx was no no friend of indigenous people, um, <laughs> but just to put it mildly. But uh, right. you also but you also have right wing people who like. I remember Glenn Beck before, Glenn Beck actually became a much more reasonable person in recent years. But you know he had he sort of combined. Oh, well, no, I <laughs> I, I, I can tell, I know Gio has strong thoughts on that, but he, you know, he had this thing where he, he sort of combined Christian um, belief with uh, the idea that like the U.S. Constitution was this sort of blueprint for like a perfect society. And there was this whole, to my mind, kind of like creepy sort of the American founders as kind of like the acolytes of some kind of political Christianity. It was like, but you could see what he craved was the idea of like returning us to a more perfect kind of world. That's an alternative to our own with Muslims. Yeah. It's like, you know, the seventh century, the time of Muhammad. Um, there's that you see this, I mean, even throughout history, like during the French revolution, they talked about like returning Europe to the values of the Romans, which, mm. you know, by the time this was like 1700 years previous, but every, so every society looks at the, the, the decadence of its of its own sins and says, what's the alternative? And unfortunately, in Western societies, there's there's very few alternatives. So there's the indigenous right. cult, you know, which in Canada is popular. Um, or but that in itself has become a, like a left wing instantiation that is reaffirming the progressive order. Yeah. So if you're like Canadian right winger who is like 
Ted Kaczynski pilled. It's like, where are you going to go? Are you going to embrace the indigenous identity? No, you can't. It's impossible. You can't, you can't because a lot of the indigenous stuff in a very colonial it's fashion coded progressive. has been, well, not only is it coded progressive, it's actually the same people who are against colonialism have, have essentially colonized the idea of ind ind indigeneity as yeah. like pacifist and feminist and like, uh, you know, hyper LGBT and. Yeah. They, they will, they will butcher native uh, ind indigenous Hmm. Uh, modes of being yeah. like the twin spirit thing, and they will code it as an identity, yeah. to, to, which to is suit, not yeah. what it is. But but, it, but as far right. as what's going on with more of the right circle, have you heard well, of wait, uh, 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 have you heard of a Bronze Age pervert? Out of curiosity, oh. Jonathan. No, but I got I got to name my Cle that, that's a great name for a klezmer band. So I think I'm gonna. Uh, well, Bronze Age perfect. Well, Geo, how would you define Bronze Age mindset? Because I think that when we're talking about something like the fascination with Russia, Bronze Age, you know, like that whole mentality, plays a real big role in there as well, where they see Putin as being like this return to this. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, I'm, yeah. I'm surprised you haven't heard about Bronze Age perfect because it seems that um, even mainstream figures, well, especially in America, uh, have written about him rather dismissively, but albeit written about I totally. Just misheard you i thought you said bronze age pervert yes. yeah and I, I said why did lev's why is lev's talking is that what you said bronze age yes. pervert yes bronze that's age a, pervert bronze age pervert exactly okay that's super weird i don't even know what it is but yes. that's like super weird oh, but, can, but can i just just finish what i was saying there sure yeah yeah go how ahead, go ahead. I, I, geo i think is in agreement that if you're on the left even though obviously the cold war ended uh more than three decades ago you know communism survives in like north Korea, like even most leftists don't want to live in North Korea, or so you don't have a lot. You, you don't have a lot of options, but you have a few options. If you're on the right side of the spectrum, you what are your no options? options? So, well, your option is like, what are you going to say? Well, okay, let's see, Mussolini, no, Nazi Germany, no. Um, you know, uh, let's see, Weird Franco people on Telegram, no. We, no Fran Franco in Spain, no. Uh, you know, the Fatherland Party in Austria, no. Like. Basically, every time you get anywhere right, you know, right of mainstream conservatism, you get into like super creepy Nazi stuff, and no one likes that, and no one should like that. Well, and then, and then, okay, well, let's, but, but then it's growing. I mean, that's then, but then you get to the Russia thing, and Russia is kind of like it lacks definition. It's sort of like this corporatist, quasi fascist, quasi white supremacist place, like. Putin talks shit, talks trash about LGBT stuff, which is like a lot of conservatives, hardcore conservatives like that. Putin's Russia, hardcore conservatives can project their fantasy of what they want their own society to be like on him. And I don't, and these are typically people who've never been to Russia. They don't know anything about Russia, but they see in Putin who just like in his body language, in his face, he looks like some kind of, you know, uh, hard ass robot dude from a movie, which they kind of like that. Um, and so they project their own sort of desperate desire for some kind of right wing alternative to democratic pluralism. They project that on Russia and imagine that he is the fulfillment of some kind of alternative to what they hate about their own societies. That's well, to, that's what I see. Well, I think what it is is that it, it's a it truly is a third position, especially because of the writings of Alexander Dugan that's become quite popular, actually, probably more in the West than in Russia, uh, because it's offering a sort of Eurasianism where, yes, it's kind of like white identitarianism, but it's not really truly the way it is in America. It's not coded with the same, like, you know, skinhead, uh, even like alt-right 1.1 type of stuff. It's not... It does. It doesn't have the same fixations on race. That's why it's very heavily criticized by white nationalists. By the way, um, I don't know if you know that one. <laughs> so Lev. I don't know anything about this, but so so they're saying, oh, this is good, but it's like not racist enough. Because because Putin, <laughs> his vision of multi multi not multi racialism, but really his vision of pluralism within a Eurasian structure is quite different than Canada, obviously by a lot miles, because these ethnicities share somewhat of a tie with each other. But it's offering you an alternative to a sort of, um, let's call it benevolent authoritarian politics that is encoded with the same smear, or at least up until recently, uh, that, you know, other like white nationalist groups have. And also there's sort of a philosophic uh, underpinning of people like Heidegger and so forth. 
And, you know, for example, Michael Millerman here in Canada, fellow Canadian, is like, you know, a translator of Dugan who got into trouble with the University of Toronto, blah, blah, blah. I actually talked to the professor that kicked him out. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's very interesting that I think that's why Russia is so appealing, like Hungary and other Eastern European nations, because they've managed to escape. Yep. I wouldn't compare those nations, though. Like that's a big. Uh, I think that's a big differentiation that I may have with you here. Looking in love, but they because, still have no, no, no. Because if you look ethos, at no, they it. don't. No, they don't. This is very. It's very important that you're pointing this out right now because if you take a country like Poland, for example, yeah, but which to has Canada been left? through. Well, I'm not going to compare anything to Canada. Well, Canada. Well, let me Canada finish my point. My point okay. is that I think you know, in in the far right, you have this division. Of course, most of us and the right wing are. Pro Russia, obviously, no matter what. But when it comes to like a very few small percentage of white nationalists, they say that, well, no, actually, the Nazis in the Ukraine, the Azov Battalion, they're the real nationalists. And so you have this like weird, so like protection yeah. of Western politics onto the. No, but you also see this weird horseshoe theory thing where, like, if there's here in the West, because I can't speak to this this stuff, but here in the West. One thing that hard leftists and and hard right wingers agree on is like Nazis are everywhere, and uh, there's, there's guys like um, God, who's that former NDP MP who's very much opposed the uh, any aid to Ukraine. Um, his name escapes me, but basically mm -hmm. these are people who are repeating the main that basically repeating Putin's propaganda to the effect that they're saying yes. Ukraine is infiltrated by Nazis. Um, NATO is very much at fault. The West is at fault here. We shouldn't get involved in helping Ukraine because uh, at best we are bullying Russia. At worst, we're helping Nazis. And then, so they, 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 they swallow Putin's propaganda. Uh, but then if you go to the other side of the spectrum and you get the right wingers, you're telling me you get people who are so far to the right that they're actually pro Ukraine yeah. on the basis of the Azov battalion of the smears that were delivered by the left who were saying we shouldn't help Ukraine because they're Nazis. So well, no, these... the majority, the vast majority of the left, apart from a very few small percent of tankies who are like communists, all of them are pro, like emphatically pro Ukraine. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they, they've, they've lined up. They've lined up. But but you do you do get a few. Um, Very who, few, yeah, that yeah. are like old school socialist. Yeah. yeah, because they see that Russia is kind of like resisting like a particular form of American imperialism. Sven Robinson. And, Sven Robinson was the guy. Yeah. 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 Hmm. But um, no. But in 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 Canada, it's very interesting how. Um, you know, you, you we have like what 300 people there that well, you know, because of Christia Freeland. Uh, but if you but say if a Canadian were to go and fight for Russia, that would be unheard of. But remember what Kosovo it would, be, you, it would actually got, probably be arrested and executed. You guys Russia. are you guys are probably too young to remember, but when NATO attacked Kosovo, uh, hmm. this is 23 years ago, yeah. um, you had a lot of leftists who lined up with Slobodan Milosevic. Really? And, oh yeah. Oh my right. god. Oh, 100 percent Whoa. By the way, they weren't. By the way, just to be fair, it wasn't like Slobodan Milosevic is creating, uh, you know, uh, a utopian society in Serbia. But they were saying that NATO is being a bully, and um, to the extent that NATO was on this side, they were on the other side. But hmm. because because these people, this was a generation ago, and we're talking about scholars and pundits who are very much marinated in cold the Cold War ethos. That if oh, Uncle, I see. That if, yeah. if the United States did A and Russia did, did B, Russia's position was understandable and America's position was mm. capitalist imperialism. But it seems the political right has adopted some of those ideas, at least in terms of being more open yeah. to anti-capitalism. Uh, for example, yeah. you know, in Toronto, well, even Americans read her, but you know, like Jan Jacobs, right? Like uh, yeah, yeah. a lot of those ideas are becoming very popular in the right wing. Mm. Um so you have this like weird sort of, I would say, right wing third worldism, where as opposed to, you know, the people opposing uh, American or Anglo American aggression would ostensibly be on the left up yeah. until like 99, 2001. But, um, well, no, I would say even like the, the mid to 2010s, like even attitudes towards um, the Muslim thing, for instance, I think a lot of people on the right 
are being like, well, that was a mistake because, you know, the, the, the Islamic world is ostensibly a power block against. You heard some yeah. hardcore conservatives line up for the Taliban uh, last year. When Kabul oh. was falling, there were some hardcore mm. GOP types. Who, oh, yeah. Who were like, you know, it's a, it was kind of like, say what you want about the Taliban, but they make the trains run on time type stuff. <laughs> Uh, but, then if, but then if we're going back to these uh, but then if we're going going back to these first principles like Gio just said the word based right now I really want to use this as an intervention to try to get Gio's audience like the people who are within this uh, group who are pro Russia to kind of see a different reality here I mean so far I haven't really been successful but uh, John, like, what and do you? You're think? not going to be successful. No, but why not? Like, what do you think? What do you think is going to take? Like, I want to really try to figure out why is it that Russia is still being supported by your side so much, Geo? I'm not even talking about the losing, but in general, just enacting a war of aggression. Why is that something to be lauded? I don't understand. You mean me, love? I mean you and uh, the people who support, you know, similar things because. I really want to understand where this is coming from. And Jonathan, I want Jonathan to understand as well so that we could figure this out. And Well, no, I think Jonathan understands like that. He, he laid it out very succinctly in that there really is um, no power. Okay. Here's the thing. There are very few, but there, there, are, you know, a faction in the right wing who are like cinephiles and who think that China is based, China crushed the curve, China can do no wrong. But the reality is, is that I think, a lot of like, especially older people on the right, they're skeptical of China because, you know, they're still communists. And especially here in Canada, you know, let's face it, China practically owns us in some ways. Um, so China is not a key rival civilization for the ang against the Anglo-American empire. Yeah, because China right. has its own problems. I agree with that. But Eastern Europe, though, is sufficiently, at least a little bit culturally, um, religiously and, of course, you know, politically aligned with a lot of right-wing ideals. And they, you know, they're still European. So can, can, so. so, can I add something to that, Lev? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. What's interesting is I have no time for, like, tyranny and Putin in particular and warmongering and stuff. I, I, I have very conventional attitudes about Ukraine, as I was disgusted by what Putin has done there. However, it's interesting, when it comes to China... I do have these impulses that like, you know, when China was sort of locking people in their houses in order to crush COVID, whereas like, you know, on the streets of Florida or the beaches, everyone was like giving each other disease and they were all dying. I, there was part of me that was like, you know what, good for China. Like I was kind of like, there was part of me that was rooting for this authoritarian impulse to somebody to say, Normal people are idiots. You guys all have to stay inside for two weeks for your own good, social credit. Like, and I, I think. Oh that, my God. Oh. That's, the, that's the Canadian. That's the Canadian. You no, know, but out. There, is, there is something where, like, the Canadian desire to kind of do the right thing and follow the rules. You look at China and say, well, okay, they're a little hardcore about it, but, but I'd rather live there than in some yahoo hee-haw society where you know everyone's just giving each other disease and well, i wrote about this I, I wrote about this the but, sort but, of integral part of the canadian identity but you're is... right if i could just add another compliment to you is that but i think you're right that the reason i feel at least internally kind of okay with admitting this forbidden thought that i'm giving you is because china is suitably distant and yes. i and i wouldn't feel okay admitting that if i were talking about like authoritarian stuff happening in poland or mm -hmm. authoritarian stuff happening in ukraine pre Zelensky, or hungry or, or hungry yeah. because it's like and i think maybe if, you know if i'm taking stock of my whiteness here uh there is a race thing here it's like well yes. those those guys look like me and it's you know those are christian societies and i live in a at least formerly mm -hmm. christian society and mm -hmm. so that's too close and oh, and that's a Nazi thing, you know. Hungary, of course, had a Nazi movement and, and was an Axis Ukraine, ally. Ukraine during World War II. But I, I, would, Ukraine, I wouldn't yeah, say no. I wouldn't say it's a race thing, though. And here's why: again, to the point of Russia, no, it's when Geo was saying exoticism, exoticism, the well, race, the race is part of it. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. when it comes to the difference between, let's say, Russia and Poland, for example, or Ukraine, for example. 
the kind of society that Ukraine has had, there were some who theorized that one of the reasons why Putin went in there was because when Ukraine was finally out of the yoke of being, you know, the little pocket purse for the Russian oligarchs, all of a sudden now people have more freedom, yet they're not that genetically different from the Russians, yet the kind of culture that they have is different. So in a way, it makes mm, Russia look really, really, really bad. It makes Russia look... Hold on, Geo, Geo, please, Geo, Geo, please, Geo, Geo, please, Geo, please. It makes Russia look really bad in comparison when you have a freer society right next to it. And I think that that may have something to do with it. But this is also why I'm not talking about a racial component here where I see people of exactly the same racial makeup living in a completely different culture where they, they are under the thumb Love, of the You dictator. have a very rose-colored glasses of Ukraine. I hate to say it, but if you look statistically at the sort of freedom index, I mean, well, they're pretty, they're pretty comparable. I mean, even right up until Zelensky got in there. I mean, it's pretty, I think you have, I think you're buying the NATO propaganda. All right, so, so very, as far as... You have a very reified view all right, of so, Ukraine society hold on, hold on, hold on. compared Geo, to Russia. Geo. Okay, so, so Jonathan, as far as Geo sees, sees it, there is no difference between Russia and Ukraine. They might as well be the same thing. So it so happens that I just listened to this incredible podcast. It's not actually finished yet. So are you guys familiar with a podcaster by the name of Mike Duncan? He did his, history of Rome and revolutions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah my, my, one of my favorite podcasters, and in his revolutions podcast, which is awesome, by the way, he has. I think it's still going. I've listened to the first seventy episodes. It's it's the Russian Revolution, and yeah, and the first. Sorry, I got my turn my phone off. Patreon.com uh, slash break the rules. Go there. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, hey, I'm back. So, um, and and as is typical of Mike Duncan podcasts even though it's about the Russian revolution, like the first 50 episodes are about the history of Russia. And he starts like in the mists of time. And what's very interesting is from, I mean, going back to like the time of the Tartars, going back to the Mongols, like going back and up to the current day, the Western border of Russia is kind of like vague um it's not completely clear like where kind of russia ends and sort of other stuff begins the west yeah yeah and and also and there was a and and there have been a number i mean a number of czars defined their rule by going back and forth on the question of whether russia was a western facing power and of course you had like people like Catherine the great who very much were you know pro-west but then you had others who were very much like hardcore traditionalists who say, no, uh, you know, it's, it's all about the Orthodox Church, the Tsar uh, and serfdom and um, screw these, you know, <laughs> th these these Germans and their funny yep, shaped sir. plows and, you know, all their technological advances and Marxism. Like, you know, they um, and and to some extent what's happening in places like Donbass it's like this, this is a centuries old thing mm. where you, you have Russians who say this is part of Russia. I mean, even at the end of the tail end of the Russian Revolution, there was all kinds of combat going on. I can in, add in, one thing about Donbass, though, which I don't know if the podcast covered or not. During uh, the time of Stalin, what he did, I mean, this was also like during the Holodomor, what he did to punish a lot of the uh, kulaks who were there making pretty successful harvests in the uh, Donbass region was he sent in prisoners russian prisoners in there for uh, mining and the descendants of those prisoners were a lot of the russian-speaking people who still live there to this day and that's where a lot of the conflict ended up starting from there after 2014 he ended up sending a lot of the uh saboteurs to go into the area and to shoot people the reason why i can say this yeah, and also such... well, hold on geo geo please geo geo <laughs> please that. geo please the reason why i'm saying this is because i have family who lives there and they are russian speakers they have never had any problems at all with people who speak Ukrainian to them and vice versa. So this idea that there was some massacring that the Ukrainians were doing towards the Russian-speaking people is complete ludicrous. Well, there's the video propaganda. evidence of it, love, but uh, well, let's if we're talking about sab talk. saboteurs that the Russian government sent, oh, I'm that sure as a battalion is sab saboteur is, uh, for the Russian government. No, no, no right, but, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. No, no, uh, but again, no, gonna... this is no, this is an important thing to clear up because uh, it seems like there is a side of the internet which Geo is part of, which believes that there is no difference at all between the aggression that Russia is showing right now and, let's say, if I were to put Ukraine in the category of the West, I would say the West, where the, let's say, whatever corruption happens in Russia is excused by saying, well, we're just as bad. 
You know, the West is just as horrible. So, you know, at least they're honest about but this, it. This is, so. a long this is a long rhetorical tradition where, I mean, this goes by the entire Cold War. This, this was what the argument was, where, you know, an American president would say, we have freedom in the West. And then, you know, I, whether it was Stalin or... Uh, Brezhnev or... Brezhnev, yeah, you know, pick your... It goes back to Lenin. Um, they'd say, well, yes, but we have freedom from starvation. We have freedom from want, freedom from inequality. And it became this like parlor game about what the word freedom means. Uh, like this, this is a longstanding tradition in, in, in the rhetoric, <laughs> rhetorical war. Um, and, and you still see it today where like um, people will talk about democracy and pluralism, freedom. Um, and then, and, and this is why I think a populist form of, 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 of conservatism is gaining ground where you do have conservatives who aren't buying the rhetoric that says, well, you know, freedom is the be all and end all of stuff. It's like, if you have a society in which you have massive in income inequality and you have corporations Black that, rock buying up everyone's homes and, yeah. and also corporations becoming agents of the most progressive kind of social dogma. Right, yep. like yep. Um, capital. Yeah. Right, and uh, and and that drives people, former traditional conservatives, into the idea is like, well, if that's what big corporations are doing, maybe this whole thing of like freedom, 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 it isn't all it was cracked up to be, and maybe we have to look at sort of models of society where it isn't just all about one person, one vote, and. And that's what you hear, by the way, you hear a lot of leftists doing this now, right? Where they're saying, well, if, if one person, one vote gives us Trump or it it marginalizes people who aren't white, then we need, maybe we have to think about other models. Um, maybe which, a bi POC can have five votes and the white and person we, and, has and half And we vote. have, we had a story of an act of, of a teacher's union here in the Toronto area, or at least Southern Ontario, which adopted, <laughs> which actually did a couple of months ago, did adopt this thing where BIPOC yes. people get more votes than white people. Oh, it man. sounds ludicrous, but they actually did this. <laughs> they did this oh. and it's crazy. But on the other hand, it's like this natural extrapolation of this idea that there's some sacred set of political ideas that are more important than the mere formalism of democracy. That, uh, and, and the left has its version of that, which is sort of like this sort of like BIPOC utopia thing and the right has its version of that which is you know whatever it is that putin thinks he's building um so you know i think both sides have the this this delusion that there's some promised land that lies behind the formalism of liberalism but i think behind that is i th i think the fact that in sort of contemporary liberalism not the liberalism of the 19th century maybe i mean it could have led to that where contemporary liberalism states that the subject is sort of an uh, sort of um a, ca a very categorizable empty cog that necessitates a subject without a history or without a sense of purpose because in order to um, live in a multi multicultural and multi -pl -pl um, plural society, you n it necessitates the need of the subject being emptied of content. Therefore, there is no grand political vision. There is just sort of a baseless, uh, you know, UN Charter of Rights, hmm. humanitarianism that doesn't really serve the needs of a but then, particular group. Okay, but then where condition. do we go from there? This is my issue. I understand uh, that the left is pretty crazy when it comes to how they want to solve these problems of inequality. But if what you're proposing is a dictatorship like Putin has, like a fascist dictatorship, that's not great either. So I'm not no, really I, seeing anything great here. No, but I think th the question rather is like, how do you how do you structure subjectivity in a liberal society that doesn't automatically lead to intense alienation? I think it's impossible, but then maybe someone like Lev would, or someone like Quilet would think that the chasm, the gap, the widening sort of lacuna between what we thought were our political ideals and what it takes to manage a pluralistic society. You know, I mean, maybe, it, is it is, some 19th century form of liberalism? Who knows, right? Like but this is so. First of all, it's Quillette, not Quillette. Sorry, so Qu Quillette. Sorry. It's sorry. Like what you did is literally a billion times worse than misgendering. <laughs> <laughs> so, Quillette. Um, yeah. So, but the pro. So this is the problem with liberalism. Mm -hmm. 
there's a wide gap there. Yeah. The problem with liberalism, yeah, there, <laughs> the problem with liberalism is that it has no dependable constituency because liberalism is an operating system. It's an operating system for people to achieve their views. And no one gets on their computer and say, oh, you know what I fucking love? I fucking love Microsoft Windows. I love installing new drivers. I love clicking on program icons. I love clicking on updates. Everybody hates the operating system because the operating system is a drag and the operating system is buggy and the operating system crashes. But without an operating system and you just say, well, you know what? Screw the OS. Just get me straight to Steam because I want to play first person shooter games. That's all I want. Like, it's like, okay, but, you know, then what are you going to do? And, yeah. and, and liberalism yeah. and, and Quilettas can be a lonely place for cons from cons in regard to conservatives who hate us and liberals who hate us or progressives who hate us, I should say, because if you're so focused on, well, like, what can liberalism get me? Um, can liberalism get me national glory today? No. Okay. Not interested. Can liberalism get me my BIPOC utopia where every profession in my country is racially delineated in exact proportion to the races that exist in my country. Oh no, you can't do that. Okay. Well then liberalism is racist and I hate it. Like we live, I guess liberalism has always been like this. Everyone's always complained about it um, because <laughs> it never aligns exactly with what they want, with what they really want. No one really wants liberalism. What they want is X, Y, and Z, and they like liberalism to the extent that it'll help them get X, Y, and Z. Yes. It's funny because, uh, you know, the, the founder of a lot of contemporary right-wing thought, him himself being a member of the tribe, but Paul Gottfried said this exactly in After Liberalism. Like, he, he directly mentions, actually, um, the Ontario Charter of Human Rights that was drafted in... Wow, that sounds 24. like a really yeah. boring book. If <laughs> no, it's quite, it's quite lively. It's no, quite, but it, you had it me... predicted right-wing discourse in you like... You had me before. until you said, and then he really focused on the Ontario. Like, I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you like, know, dude, he, it was a few pages, but he used you this illustration. Work on your showmanship, Gio. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 right, but like... that, Okay, but then I'm trying to figure out. So It was an you, aside. It was okay, aside. So, so, enough, so, so, John... As you may already know, I am in your position. I am a liberal. I consider myself to be a classic liberal. The chat hates me for it, and I don't give a crap that they hate me for it because I think it's the best position you could possibly have. But what I don't understand is why isn't Geo a liberal? Can we get Geo to become a liberal today? Never. But, but Never. For, so not only do I do we not want Geo to become a liberal because the thing is about liberalism requires some sort of foil. And, and you see this right. in the way people talk right. about liberalism, because when, when somebody says, um, hey, let's I don't like this book, let's burn it. Right. And you say, no, 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 you shouldn't burn it, because then we're like, then we're like the Nazis. Then we're like, the, you have to use historical memory to remind people, because it's true at that moment. If it's a bad book, of course, we want to burn it. Why wouldn't we want to burn a bad book? Like and you have to say, zoom out. Look at history, see where this leads. That's why people make fun of Goodwin's law on the internet, where every conversation, like within 15 minutes, gets to someone being accused of Hitler. The Austrian painter, yeah. To some extent, that's a predictable feature of any discussion of liberalism, because liberalism cannot be justified except by reference to the alternative. And the alternative right. is always like, well, it's we a ameliorative it identity at the end of the day because it claimed to have conquered all other ideologies. But oh, sorry, go go ahead, John. Go ahead. But well, yeah, it's I mean, this was sort of Francis Fukuyama's thing to some extent. It says I'm not sure he used the term conquered, but to me, liberalism is the residue that still exists when you boil away everything that is utopian or um, murderous or totalitarian or leads to those outcomes. And right. you say, what's what's the operating system which prevents us from those outcomes? And unfortunately, there is no OS that gets you, um, that what? always prevents you, but liberalism is the best we have. But, but it no depends on who you talk to though, because I would think that a lot of political factions would say that liberalism leads to the same amount of death and destruction, just it's hidden under no. the guise of humanitarian intervention or so. But, but, well, the data says otherwise, like, so I don't know if you guys are New York Times readers, but the New York Times had, I mean, look, one thing liberals and conservatives agree is that they hate the New York Times, but I, the New York Times print edition at least had a pretty interesting graph yesterday where they showed total deaths from military combat by decade. And I got to say, since 
the Korean War, like the world on a per capita basis has experienced the 70 most peaceful years it has in, in, in the history of the world. But it, and, 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 this has been, and this has been a liberal era. That's the, that coincides with the liberal era until Putin ruined it. Yeah. Well, no, but but it's Ruined not it just everyone. like, but well, I mean, well, I guess you'd have to like put an asterisk on Iraq no, and Afghanistan. There's a no, lot like, of asterisks. Well, there's a lot of asterisks. Yeah. I agree. But yeah. no, but what I'm saying is that even besides, well, well, no, just e even with that, conquest, though, hold on, real quick, I gotta get into, despair, I gotta get in about the Iraq thing. I gotta get into the Iraq thing. It, well, correct no. me if I'm wrong, Jonathan. Is it not the case that so far, in terms of any of these interventions, wars, whatever you want to call them, with Iraq, Afghanistan, these areas, so far America has not gone into the equivalent of Canada or Norway. It has gone into areas that we could say are fascistic in their system of government. Not to say that it's great that America did that, but just so we have a, an order of operations here. I, I, I'm well, not he's doing this. He's doing this to make Putin look worse than what America. Uh, did I don't need. I don't need to do anything to make Putin work worse. Uh, oh Putin yes, yes. Right. I'm sure the, right. the two million yes, yes, dead yes, Iraqis. Sorry, okay, wait, wait. Here, 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 please displaced. let Jonathan talk. Yes, let Jonathan okay. talk, please. I, I, I look. I, 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 I'm on both your sides because I, 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 I kind of agree with Geo that this kind of thing of like, well, let's compare this. That it, it, the thing is, every counterexample invites another counterexample. I, so I'm very uncomfortable. I'm very uncomfortable with any analogy that that puts Zelensky in the same category as Saddam Hussein. To me, that's nonsense. Um, like you know, the Ukraine may have been a corrupt and semi-democratic, you know, um, society, or still is. Shouldn't use the past tense. But to compare it, the the Baathist regime that Saddam Hussein had was was a complete a complete hellhole. Like, um, and it's, it's absolutely true that the Americans completely botched the, um, the dismount on their, this will be the second Iraqi war. Um, but, but I'm completely uncomfortable with any analogy that, that takes, say, the invade, America's invasion of, of, of Iraq and say, well, that's morally equivalent. I think it ended up being a mistake, but it was, you, you can't say that it's morally equivalent to what Putin was doing uh, in Ukraine. On the other hand, I also am not comfortable, Geo, in, in getting into this whole thing is like, well, how many lives has, has American capitalism taken and stuff like that? So, like, because you were saying, well, following on that thought before, you're saying, well, putting aside the number of combat deaths that took place in the last seven years, how many lives have been lost? I would argue that if we've lived, I have lived in a very peaceful time. Um, it's absolutely true that some of the things that America did in terms of its foreign policy, Latin America, certainly parts of Africa, you could mm -hmm. argue parts mm -hmm. of the Middle East, uh, pretty amoral and in some cases just ruthless. Uh, in many cases, many lives were lost as a result of, of in Mexico. If you look at American intervention in Mexico uh, during the Civil War, I mean, all sorts of, of terrible things happened. However, statistically, again, this comes back to, to me being a cheerleader for liberalism, the liberal era, Fukuyama was wrong that liberalism or our liberal order meant the end of history. It has not meant the end of history, but I would say it's been a pretty great period of history. When you, this is, I, I talk about Mike Duncan's podcast. One of the reasons I listen to historical podcasts in general, because right now I'm listening to a great one on the history of England, is just to appreciate how awful everything was before like 15 minutes ago. Like, Right now, you know, the, the History of England podcast, I'm listening to these um, uh, during the Edwardian period, these raids that um, the, the Duke of Lancaster would make into Gascony and into other areas of France. I mean, these were basically just the, and all of France was terrorized by these English raiding parties, just whole towns raped, pillaged, burned. This was just normal life. In, in the 14th century, this was just like kind of how people lived. And in terms of the per capita number of people who died or were raped or were like, you know, kids, horrible things happening to children, like your worst nightmare. Ever. This was just like daily life for peasants. And it gives me this baseline to look at the imperfections of our liberal order, because life in our you know, much as they hate whiteness and capitalism and democracy and pluralism, like our society is pretty fantastic. And I, I have my criticism of Canada, but Canada is awesome. I love Canada. That's why I'm so pissed at Trudeau is always pissing all over it. 
you know, uh, but I the... think Sorry, well, the ahead. problem is that people attri to attribute that to liberalism. That's the mistake. A lot of what liberalism purports to do in terms of so what do you attribute to? So who do you? Well, do technological you... advancement is probably the biggest um, oh. mask of any contradiction that exists within liberal society. I okay. think as time goes on, as those contradictions become more apparent, then we're going to probably see maybe not as extreme as you know the periodic invasion of England towards France, because you know as you know every king you know if. Uh, there's not enough tax money, invade France. Um, you know, the Duke of Wellington didn't perform as well, invade France. Then, But I think, like, as time goes on, we're starting to see that those contradictions are seeping above the surface, and who knows what's going to happen. Well, China, Especially if we have rival power blocks. China well, well, yeah, like China. China shows us that that uh, mm. a, great, a great power can enrich itself and excel technologically without... Right. All of the liberal, although even China has adopted econo economic liberalism to a right. great extent. Yeah, yeah. So, guys, and, I, and, and their, their level oh, of growth, Jonathan, you can really trust yes. the numbers as well. That's wait, wait, wait Jonathan, I had a question. Yes, Jonathan. Uh, this is a meta question. Like, I, you guys have an incredible amount of energy. How long does these podcasts go? Because I'm losing it. All right. Well, we go I think we can we, we like, can uh, pretty much end it uh, in the next five minutes. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to ask you okay, one more thing. Gio, Gio okay. has a question. But before that, I have one more question to ask as well. And Jonathan, I really appreciate you being here doing this. And the question, again, I feel like this is kind of a mini intervention for Gio's side <laughs> of the internet. Because what BTR, oh. what BTR does, no, no, I'm serious. What BTR every does, Jonathan, week, what week. BTR does is it brings in mainstream people together with people who are from the very online so that people can understand each other more so that bubbles can be broken and i feel like right now the reason why i mentioned this guy bronze age pervert he is this uh, twitter moniker he wrote this book called bronze age mindset is because i really feel like a lot of the things you were describing the rapes the pillaging all that that is something that was encapsulated within the bronze age mindset book as being something that a spoiled society does not have access to today. So it's almost like a lot of people online long for this time where they got to, you know, show how tough they were and, you know, suffer well, against the elements. And... Well, that's a caricature. Bronze Age mindset is more of, a, I guess you would call it Nietzschean vitalism. It's very much um, Hellenistic, <laughs> you know. Um, they talk about how decadent Western society has ignored the beauty of the body and so forth. And a BAP, he um, has really, um, I would say, an alternative to the typical like white nationalist politics of like the far right. And a lot of people has they've created an aesthetic around Br mm. Bronze Age period. But it's similar it's to Spengler. Like a, it's, it's similar. Yeah, it's to very much Spen Spengler or Ernst Younger or Nietzsche. Yeah. Very much that. Yeah, but again, it, it does. It does. It does seem really weird to me that a lot of these people are very online and they're looking at a time that they've never existed in. I don't know. Well, I don't know what can be done. as well. That's a big thing. Sure. Too. And yeah. I respect that. I respect the bodybuilding and the raw egg slonking. But in general, Jonathan, my final question to you before Gio's question is, what do you think can be done here as far as grabbing this need for romance and channeling it into something that would not, let's say, advocate for a dictatorship like Putin's? So... First of all, Gio, I gotta say you you take a lot of abuse here, but I, I but you, you don't make I'm it used easy, to it. Don't worry. Like, about but it. you don't make it easy on yourself because you know you say this stuff like, oh, it's not creepy. It goes back to Nietzsche, and I was like, no, 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 dude, <laughs> like that's you, 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 you're not helping yourself. So it's no, uh, no. I'm not, like as a Catholic, I have a lot of problems with it. I get it, but I, even that, I just but like all of these strands go to go to go to some pretty. You have to be be very careful where the. Uh, where the mines are, because there's uh, there's a lot of stuff. Well, I so, mean, I could mention Julius Civola and all. <laughs> so, yeah, this uh, almost as bad as Nietzsche, I guess, or maybe worse. So look, um, I, I think I, I see this. I live. I, I'm very fortunate. I live a privileged life, and a res as a result of living a privileged life, I'm surrounded by people who have a, many of their basic needs satisfied. Right. So right. they have they have they have money, they have food, they have shelter, they, and so it's interesting to see what happens to these people. A lot of them become really religious They or they become very Zionistic, which is not the same thing. Um, or they become very passionate about like some, to my mind, like obscure gender thing. Like they just announce that their kid is like gender queer and it's a thing and it's always been a thing. And if you don't believe it's a thing, then you're not my friend. And like, 
they they're become reading for, Pacalifia or whatever. Yeah, they Judith become Butler. Yeah, well, I mean, Judith Butler was old-fashioned by the standards of some of the stuff. That, but, oh, yeah, yeah. But but even old, Michelle Foucault is incredibly problematic to a lot of their. His life was very problematic. <laughs> so. Uh, this is this i get a lot of heat on the right wing for being a because i when i went, went to grad school that was my big thing michelle Foucault. but please go go, go ahead go ahead yeah Sorry. he's uh his, his, his life was a little weird but he um but the point is that you know i just interviewed sam harris on my podcast and for him it's like he wants he's this guy like obviously very wealthy very successful but he he longs for this the transcendence that comes from meditation and you see the jordan peterson fans is like they're looking for a sense of mission and right. ev every way around, and you see this especially often among people whose needs have been met in life, is like, what am I here for? Like, you know, my wife earns more money than me. Uh, you know, what's what's my mission? What, what what can I contribute? And and they start going on these historical reveries of like an age of like where I was like a Teutonic knight and men were men and was and it, like it's all bullshit, but it's bullshit that's grounded in this essential human longing to be the hero of your own story and to have a romantic vision of life where you're conquering enemies, you're helping your tribe, you're protecting your family, stuff that modern life makes difficult. And, right. you know, and so a lot of these guys, we say, oh, you're in, you're an incel or, you know, you're some kind of like hipster fascist. Or we or, call you a bug man or whatever. Yeah. I mean, like you've recited some of these names here. I, I don't even know half of them, but the point is that, <laughs> In the same way, we're going full circle here. Can we talk about the conspiracist thing? I said, we're never going to get to a point where people don't need explanations for evil because bad things always happen to good people. By the same token, the problem of human comfort and human wealth is that it generates a society where people have no heroic sense of their own purpose exactly. because, because their needs have been met. And so they often go into these like weird and sometimes unsettling historical, mythological, spiritual, religious or to my mind, radical political ideas, which supply them with like, they're the, guy, they're, the, they're the airbrushed Viking on the side of the van who's like draped in fur and defending the castle from the monster. Like that's kind of what a lot of, especially men want to be more than women because men derive their social function from facing external threats instead of tending to their loved ones. I thought I'd just finish on something wildly. Yeah, but also the average middle class woman, I think, is like really, you could say the average middle class white woman is like the most privileged being in all of human history when you really think about it. Hey, That's probably I, why. I, I don't know how many of them, I don't know how many of them are in the comment thread, but shout out to all the Karens. I, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm married to one. Uh, yeah. Guys, I got to go. I, I don't know how you guys do it. I, I don't have the... the all right, uh, Jonathan. One it last was, thing. Oh. Um, what do you think, though, of... The uh, the because a really good friend of mine is uh, she did a very excellent speech with you and a few other people is Annie Slats. And um, what do you are you still getting incredible heat for the uh, trans issues or what do you think of the whole is it died down a little bit or do you think it's still going? Uh, died down. I think the the peak of the political influence of god every term you use will be controversial but call it gen gender ideology and, yeah. and by gender ideology i mean the belief that by an act of declaration you can declare yourself to be man or woman or something in between and that biology is subservient to these acts of declaration so um that ideology that i just described probably peaked in terms of like a, an unassailable dogma in many western societies probably sometime maybe 2019 2000 no maybe 2020 mm. 2021 yeah um and i think the last year or two in particular women especially god bless them feminists uh, sometimes they call themselves radical feminists, but like, mm -hmm. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't pretend to know all the flavors of feminism. Gender critical. Gender um, crits. Yeah. I mean, but like yeah. these are, or TERFs. I mean, these are, everything is a term of abuse and, and the, the terms change every 15 minutes. So I, I, if someone's watching this podcast next week, I'll become a, a thought criminal. So I don't want to use these terms. The point is that they have fought back successfully while a lot of men have sort of been like, uh, what's going on here? Um, I shouldn't say anything or I'll be canceled a lot of women have fought back and as a result you're now seeing more of a debate about this 
Yeah. And it's like everything else where, you know, when I was a kid, transphobia was a huge problem, a huge problem. It's, it was, cons when I was a kid, it was considered acceptable to just openly mock anybody who was what we would now call transgender. The term transgender was not in common usage 30 years ago, but if, you know, whatever, tra transsexual. Transsexual, cross-dresser. Yeah. Yeah. Pe yeah. These, these people were, had no rights and they were mocked, you know, you, uh, uh, a, a comedy sketch review show neither of you have heard of called Benny Hill. Uh, it, <laughs> I've it, heard of it. Yeah. It was like a constant thing. There was like some guy in a dress where like, and he'd chase around. Anyway, so they were, it was just, they were figures of mockery and transphobia, as we would now call it, I don't think that term was in wide usage back then, was, was rampant. And then society, to its credit, moved to address transphobia. And as with everything else, it swings too far. It's like a pendulum. And, and it got to the point where it was like, some guy, some, some guy, some person like Leah Thomas can put on a women's bathing suit and um, become a woman's uh, swimming champion. Make a few funny pills. Yeah. And 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 we're all supposed to like be yay. Women can do anything. Like like that's <laughs> not only do, yeah. do they get the medal, but it's also like none of us are supposed to say how screwed up that is. Right. That I think that's over. Where where people aren't allowed to say that's screwed up. And you're mm -hmm. seeing women. So I think if you're asking me, has it peaked? Yeah, it peaked probably a year or two ago. We're still, especially in Canada, because Canada's behind the other countries, we're, we're still a couple of years away from, um, I say, coming. You need a common sense solution, which balances the legitimate rights of everyone to be free from discrimination with the fact that there's this thing called biology and sexual dimorphism, which has guided human development for a couple of hundred million years. And indeed, all mammalian development. Well, it's and, it's funny oh, because oh, well, I, England, I know Jonathan has to go soon. I just want to make oh, yeah. sure. I was going to say I think it will probably change, and uh, our good friend Annie Slats will probably help that uh, in Canada because they, we really are behind. I mean, in she England, is, she wrote for me. Annie Slats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because England is the epicenter of like the mommy, like mums net. I guess, ter I mean, ter but turf means Nazi now too. Yeah, it's a term of abuse. It's a term of yeah. abuse. Yeah, and the, the Brits... Gender critical fought, feminism, put it that way. They yeah. fought back. Uh, I mean, J.K. Rowling actually came late to the game, but you had people <laughs> like Helen, Helen Joyce. Um, yes, Helen Joyce. And I was, you know, I don't want to list all of the... Uh, Mary Harrington, good friend of the show mm. of ours. Kath, yes. Kathleen Stock. Um, uh, and, of course, you had uh, Kira Bell, the litigant. Who, oh, uh, that's right. Uh, Anyway, Even I better Judy go. Bindle. All right, Judy Jonathan. Bindle. Judy Bindle, so yes. Judy Thank Bindle. you so much for Judy coming Bindle. in. Please buy Jonathan's Thank you. book. It's been a pleasure. Among the Truthers, A Journey Through America's Growing uh, Conspiracist Underground. It was a great pleasure to have you on, Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming in. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Gio. Thank you, love. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. And with oh, that, we got to get Annie Slats on the show. I could, yes, I could contact that'll, her. That'll be pretty fun. Uh, so anyway, I just want to say we are uh, we are ending right now. I am going to go eat. But before that, I just want to thank everybody for watching. L press the like yeah. button. Press the oh, like yeah. button like you mean it. Okay. One more it thing. I might important. not be here uh, Thursday because I have a family thing. So mm. we'll see. But it's about, what is it about? Atlantis? It's going to be about Atlantis. That's right. Who is this woman? This, this very Johanna, attractive Johan woman? Yeah, Johanna James. Uh, she this is Aryan a, princess she is Valkyrie. <laughs> She is an actress and uh, from England, from I, I believe uh, London, and you oh, know wow. she's like a mainstream, you know, mainstream celebrity actress. And uh, what she, shows has she been on? Uh, I'm going to load up her IMDb and tell you. I'm not sure if you uh, watch the uh, British shows or not. Yeah, she's I watch a... tons because of my parents. They watch BritBox. Ah, oh, okay. So maybe maybe there's gonna be something in here. And once again, everybody, add those likes. Need the Wait, super chats. Wait, how do you spell her I, name, Joe? Johanna James. J A H. A N N A H James, as in you know, like James. regular James. Okay, yeah. so she is known for. Uh, let's see, right now she's on Deep Heat. Before that, she was in Shoot Your Shot. Before that, After Party. No, these are shorts. So TV series, The Self Tapers, Ministry of Justice. Oh, I've uh, heard of Ministry. Yeah, I think I watched. A few but the one that yeah. she's known for is Brotherhood. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. She played Penny, Body of Water, where she played Daisy. Four deaf Yorkshiremen, uh, where she played Dawn. Wow, she was an alien covenant. 
Oh, Whoa. wow. Yeah. Amazing. So, well, speaking of aliens, uh, she's talking about Atlantis, ancient civilizations, things of that nature. And she uh, befriended Randall Carlson, who uh, mentioned her on Joe Rogan's uh, podcast. So, you know, she's getting up in the world. And I've uh, heard of Randall Carlson. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, well, Randall Carlson is the guy who, uh, along with Graham Hancock, talk about how 11,000 years ago there was this cataclysm, and uh, uh, he looks at the scab lands and, um, you know, the upper part of the U.S. and uh, lower parts of Canada, you know, like that whole region where he talks about uh, there being a glacier that mm. was destroyed and uh, the intense pressure. Yeah, the intense yeah. pressure of it destroyed all the oh, civilizations there. I forgot to ask Jonathan. We didn't have enough time, but uh, I wanted to ask him about Randy Hellier, who is a politician here that was arrested by the Trudeau regime. Um, he's out on bail, so he didn't get arrested, executed, but he was one of the leading voices in the convoy and uh, Trudeau is now politically persecuting him. So uh, my thoughts are out to uh, my thoughts and prayers are out to Randy Hillier. I know he says some kind of radical stuff, not like radical, like in, uh, you know, like in a white now way. But he says like you know boomer, you know, I guess you could say boomer conservative stuff. But no, I mean his they they targeted him from the beginning. So I, too bad I didn't get to ask Jonathan about that. But uh, yeah, so we got to go. Um, hopefully it'll be a good mm -hmm. stream. Well, let's do, the, uh, let's do the Super Chats right now. Oh, yeah, so, there's some. Yes, that's right. Spicy ones in there. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. And again, uh, everybody add a like, patreon.com slash break the rules. You know, what is I don't... the camera angle, by the way? Let me check here live. Uh, it's not bad. I, I see your face. You just got to oh, move yeah, a little yeah. bit forward. It's, it's bigger in the screen. Yeah, the problem, the problem with StreamYard as opposed to Zoom is that it's difficult to oh, adjust the go. camera angles based on. Yeah, but there's this nice yeah. little setup here with the thing in the middle. Anyway, so here. We go. Love Polyakov going to be arrested by Russian patriots and executed <laughs> soon. <laughs> so the okay. Z patriots are going to uh, Love Polyakov arrested and executed in 20 minutes after yeah. screen. You, you, so, you, know, you know what the latest trend is, by the way, for all the Russian supporters. The, what's all the Russian supporters. Listen, if you're a Russian supporter on Twitter, the latest trend I heard is you have to put the uh, Greek initial of Z a, uh, after your name. That's oh, the, I gotta do that yeah, when I come back to Twitter. I've been doing. on a Twitter break. I've been writing this article about the online right, and uh, it came after people th thought I was blackpilling or whatever when I said that. You remember that tweet, Lev? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the symbol I'm talking about, right? The Zeta symbol. Oh, the, uh... yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there so you, go. you gotta add the Zeta symbol into your profile, and that's how everybody's gonna know that you're a fan so of the, Russia. So uh, the, the GRU, uh, is that what they call the KGB now, the Russian intelligence, the GRU? No, no, it's the uh, FSB. FSB, yes. SFB Patriots, 20 minutes, Love Polyakov arrested and executed by Putler. So there you go. <laughs> All right, so let us go on to the Super Chats, everybody. So here we go. Uh, 34 minutes ago, Massive McGee, two pounds, is us is Russia is vague? What? What about Israel's border? I have no idea what that means. Israel's border is one of the tightest borders in the world. Like they literally have a wall. They have a Trump wall. Make make Israel great again. Listen, the Samson option is dark. Mika. The ABC uh, two dollars. K doesn't even have the Vril required for a BTR. Listen, Vril is not yeah, all about the muscle. Yeah, I was shocked actually. He was. Yeah. Oh, Vril... you mean he had to go? But listen, the guy is almost like pushing fifty. Don't worry about. Yeah, no. no. You know, this was this was amazing. He's not. A, he's an actual journalist. He's been doing this in Canadian <laughs> media. I've been reading him in the most mainstream of papers since I was literally 13 years old. He is not a since fucking you were, online since you, were, since you were 13 years old, since you were in your diapers, you've been reading him. Oh my god! Um, no, <laughs> he was like he's—he's he's not like he doesn't have the schizo energy of a Twitter poster. I'm sorry, my like, God forbid he doesn't go for five hour streams. So uh, he's got a life. He's got you know. <laughs> And anyways. yes, and anyway, wish you, you would have stayed another hour, but yeah, what are you gonna do? This was great. Listen, thank you guys so much for watching. You know, he's really? got a what? colleague actually, this um South Asian woman. Her name is uh, you'd like her level. She I'm was sure. she she wrote this article for Barry Weiss's Substack mm. um about the convoy that's called What Does the Convoy Want? I'll look her name up, but you'll like her. She's a friend of Barry Weiss. So Sounds good. Go. 
All right, and once again, uh, patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron. You're not going to regret it. The farm stream, I think that's going to be done, if not next week, then the week after next week. So that should be a very interesting stream. If I stream. keep talking, I'll be arrested and executed by the RCMP so, in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, they're going to come with a Mountie uniform and everything. Yes. Yeah. Wait, by the way, Gio, I mean, I guess I kind of want you to... Uh, I, I, I want to spoil it, but do you know what that symbol means? The uh, that that Zeta symbol that I talked about. I, I've read articles on. Doesn't it mean? Uh, yeah, it's 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 vague. It's funny. What does it mean, love? Y you don't know what it means. Okay. I'll, I'll have to consult my uh, what, why do people, with attitude. Why do people put the uh, Zeta symbol in their uh, Twitter profile? You why? don't know. See, yeah. I don't even want to tell you now. Oh God, why? Should I tell you? Yeah, go ahead. I almost, okay, I mean, you're off Twitter right now, apparently, for some reason, but uh, it, it means... Well, but since, it's because I wanted to take a break, and I wanted to sort of put out... Like, I, I pr promised myself that I wasn't going to go back unless I really did this article <laughs> explaining my criticism of the online right, but go ahead, go ahead. Mm. Oh, wait, before I do that, actually, Gio, you look, look up what it means, because there's internet friend who says that he did not uh, get the super chat. That is not because I skipped it, I think. Well, that's internet because... friend, you know what the Z means. You're, I think. Oh, here we go. No, I mean the Zeta symbol on the Twitter profiles, what that oh, means. Oh, yeah. Yes. So Massive McGee, two pounds. Congratulate Hopper for getting a GIF. Congratulations, Hopper. So It's a GIF. <laughs> If you're what reminder that the Roxy homie who is a oh no <laughs> you motherfuckers look at that fur reminder the Zeta symbol is a symbol commonly used by zoo files oh yeah that's right the, the oh that's right that's right the um the uh Toad Makino Toad McKinley you know Toad McKinley right sounds familiar did yes. did the the did the um the really sick, disgusting podcast. Thank God that guy's burning in hell. He died of pancreatic cancer. The zoo, zoo, <laughs> zooer than thou podcast. He did the documentary on the zoo, zoo tales. Um, apparently the Z symbol in the Greek is uh, for zoo files. Um, reminder: the symbol is commonly used by Twitter by zoo files. If you see symbol in a user's display name or bio, block immediately. No respect for anyone who abuses animals. Oh, this tweet is from 2020, from from a furry. Yeah, Gio, I expected you to be up on these things, and yeah, well, I mean, I I guess like it's how 4chan took the um you know free bleeding or whatever. Like they took it's Foucault called it a counter discourse lab. We're take us based <laughs> Russian right wing nationalists are freeing the Greek Zeta from the furry zoophile perverts who deserve to burn in hell for touching animals in fact in in a in Putler's russia furries are well we're gonna get them we're gonna help them along and no the russia. only furries that are allowed in russia are bears but anyway uh they, this is, this is they the have, no they call them shamans lav up there in siberia they have the bear suit um what 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 are, the, where are those group what's the group called that they they came up with the term shaman because of that and I should insult them by associating them with furries, but you know they they well, drink. Well, we already reindeer. had a stream about that with the furries, where there was a an angle about shamanism that yeah, was yeah yeah the reindeer yeah. What but do they know, call them, Lev? They they dress up in bear suits. Oh, I don't know, Geo. I Lev, I, you're Russian. You even know they're the top indigenous Gio, group of Russia. I'm, I'm a bad Russian. I'm a bad Jew. I'm a great American. What can I tell you? Okay. <laughs> anyway, this is the end of the stream. Thank you guys so much for watching. Oh. Really appreciate it. Tune into the Atlantis thing. You're going to see that as soon as this stream ends. So be sure to uh, bookmark it. You know, set a reminder. It's happening. It's happening this Thursday, 3 p.m. sharp. Take care.